right, today we are beginning our new series, Oh, the Places You'll Go. And I think you can tell from that bumper video that it's going to be a lot of fun. And it is. We're going to be looking at life's journeys. And specifically, we're going to follow the paths of the two great prophets of Israel, Elijah and his Padawan learner, Elisha. And we're going to see through their journey maybe how God can connect with us and keep us faithful even when life is a little hard. So let's get to our reading and let's see where the story is placing us so that we can find ourselves within God's story. So we're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning at verse 17. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? But Elijah replied to Ahab, I have not made trouble for Israel, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls, prepare it first, since there are many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. And so they took the bull, given them, and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying, until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, And he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham... Isaac and Israel. Let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all the things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So what does a story about ritual sacrifice and blood have to do at all with a children's book? I'm sure you're thinking that. I've wrestled with that a little bit this week as well. Let me just say, maybe a bit more than you would discover at first. Maybe just a bit more than we realize, because that's the genius of Dr. Seuss. The genius of Dr. Seuss is that you think you're reading children's books, but these become books that you read throughout your lifetime. How else would Dr. Seuss have sold hundreds of millions of books? 
that are so popular. These are principles, these are morals that are not just for kids, but they're really for all of us. And so this is going to come into real life and everything that we're doing. Uh, this particular book was published when he was 87 years old, right before he passed away, about a year before he passed away. And it became kind of his magna opus. Like his, this became the book that kind of sealed the whole thing. It was his farewell, farewell salute to all of us. He's sharing a lifetime of wisdom, but it has humor. And, 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 and as an added bonus, you, you just think about the way that it has impacted kids and how we pass this on to kids. So yeah, they're simple enough for kids, but it's beloved by adults as well. See, when we were kids, we couldn't wait to grow up. We couldn't wait, and we thought we'd become adults, and we'd just figure it all out. We'd graduate high school, then we'd go to college. We'd all get married. We'd have a good job. We'd have a bunch of kids, or maybe, maybe just two. And then we finally have all the answers. And then you become a parent like me, and you're like, whoa, no, 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 no. I was all wrong. It didn't work out by the script, because you never have all the answers. I never have all the answers. You're always learning and you never arrive. And you never figure it all out. And life is like a continual process. It's like a journey and, and God's always ahead of you and just leading you on. And sometimes the journey becomes harder when you grow up. In fact, most of us, we find that to be true. When you become adult, you think you're becoming independent, but then you realize when life gets hard, you have to become even more dependent on those around you. You need your family. You need your friends. You're not independent at all. And I might say as a pastor, you start to realize more and more that you really needed God on the whole journey as well. You can't go it alone. And if you try to, you'll be miserable and you'll be alone. And that's the worst punishment of all. Dr. Seuss said it this way, and I want you to look up here at the cartoon. Uh, this is what he says. He says, you'll be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar to high heights. You won't lag behind because you'll have the speed. You'll pass the whole gang and you'll soon take the lead. Wherever you fly, you'll be the best of the best. Wherever you go, you will top all the rest, except when you don't, because sometimes... You won't. I'm sorry to say so, but sadly it's true that bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. You can get all hung up in a prickly perch, and your gang will fly on. You'll be left in a lurch. By the way, one of Seuss's old characters shows up in the book, or at least I think he does, uh, Horton from Horton Hears a Who. I think the elephants that are in this book, if you ever read through this book, I think the elephants are designed exactly after Horton. And I love that book, Horton Hears a Who. And by the way, kids, we promised you that we're going to pass out the Oh, the Places You Will Go passport. And that's your code word for today. Your code word for today is Horton. Make sure you spell it right. But your code word for today is Horton because he's one of my favorite Seuss characters of all. So kids, you can write that now. Write that down on your passport. And here's the thing. We all have dreams, and, and we all have places that we want to go, um, or things we want to accomplish. We, we, we all have those kinds of dreams. And it's awesome to dream, and it's great when you first set off on your journey. You're so excited. But what happens when you find yourself, in the words of Dr. Seuss, in that prickly perch? What happens when you find yourself there? And I think that's what the prophet Elijah is facing here on the mountain. God has called him to lead his people. God has called Elijah to lead his people back to faithfulness, back to true love, back to hope in the future that God has set up for the world. And Elijah, he has to explain that they're sinning, and that's why life isn't going well, and that Ahab, the king over everything, and that Ahab is actually the one distracting them the most, pulling them the most away from God. And even more specifically, uh, it's not like King Ahab likes being blamed. It's not like King Ahab likes getting called out. People in power often don't. And so when Elijah does, that's why he finds himself at a prickly perch. He's doing the very thing that God wants him to do. 
And yet, that gets him in the most trouble. See, sometimes when you follow God the best in your life, the rest of the world isn't going to like it. People don't like being called out. And so Ahab finds himself trying to kill the person, Elijah, who's the one person who can lead them back to God, who's the one person who can help save them. See, Ahab, he doesn't have a drought problem in our story. I mean, that's what he thinks he has. He thinks there's a drought and a famine. He doesn't have a drought problem. He doesn't have a famine problem. Ahab has a God problem because he's turned away from God. And this is how 1 Kings describes him. Just a little bit before our story, this is how 1 Kings describes King Ahab. It says that Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those kings before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. Can you imagine saying that someone is the worst person that ever lived? I mean, think about the kings. King David was good, and and Solomon was was pretty good some of the time, and and Josiah and Hezekiah, they, they get a little bit of props in the Bible. But most of the kings of Israel were pretty evil. The The Bible's clear. They were evil, and in fact, morally, just personally, they were even worse, even worse than their jobs as kings. They did a worse job just just even living. But Ahab, Ahab's the worst of the worst. He's the worst king that they've ever had. And and God pretty much, there's never going to be a godly king, but God pretty much just says, this guy is awful, and Ahab takes a cake. And not only that, This all really, really takes hold when he marries Jezebel, who's a Phoenician princess. And he sells out his church membership, and he becomes a member of the Baal cult. The Baal cult. He is completely sold out on everything that God wants. Now, if you're a prophet, Jezebel, the the princess of Phoenicia, who becomes his queen, Jezebel has all the warmth of a TSA agent. Like, She is just not somebody, if you're a prophet and you're speaking for God, she has no interest in truth. And maybe that's why today, that the thing we most know her for today isn't necessarily this story, but it's a label that we put on people. A Jezebel is somebody who's lewd, or somebody who's cruel, or somebody who's just plain evil. We call them a Jezebel. That's what history remembers about her. What could get someone that sort of reputation? What could make a name like that live on for so long? It's a fertility cult. That's what it is. And I know we're talking about children's books in the series, but it's the fertility cult. And this is where I wish we had children's church today so we could send the kids away. But you know what? This is in the Bible, and we want to teach the Bible to our people. Um, And honestly, some things in the Bible are just not rated G or PG. They're just not. And guess what? Neither is life. You watch the news. Watch the news today. Watch it this morning. Life's not rated G. It's not rated PG. And and there's lots of violence and lots of hate and lots of racism. In the case of this fertility cult, there's just lots of rampant evil that's going on. And see, sometimes we wish Noah's Ark was just a story about sweet animals on a boat. But we forget that there was a flood. We forget that there's judgment. And so we need to take the Bible for what it really is and not just sanitize it, not just neuter it for our own good. Now, I know it's easier to tell the story of David and Goliath when you're using a tomato and a cucumber. I like VeggieTales as much as the next person. My kids watch VeggieTales as well. But the story is a little bit more than that. And that's what you're going to find on your life's journey. You're going to find sometimes the places that you go that the Bible is not censored because life isn't censored. And that's why the Bible is so relevant to everything we're going through. So what is a fertility cult? A fertility cult looks at everything that's going on in your world. And when you have problems like a drought or famine, You start to believe that maybe the gods are angry with you. 
And so you start doing different religious practices to try to get the gods aroused so they send their seed down and they water your crops or they feed your animals. And, and it might start off as prayers and it, and it might intensify a little bit more to, to dancing and shouting. But at some point in a fertility cult, there, there was a point where people began to, to cut themselves and bleed as if that would maybe arouse the gods. And of course, that ultimately leads to the biggest sacrifice you can give, the sacrifice of your firstborn, child sacrifice. That's what it is. And child sacrifice has been in cultures all over the world. It's not just unique to Baal. There's something that's primal, and, and I would say that's, that's evil in the heart of man, that thinks somehow this is how you impress the gods. In the Baal cult, they also had temple prostitution. Literally, priestesses who were prostitutes, and that somehow through those kind of acts, you could arouse the gods even more. And so this is what Elijah's up against. He's up against this sort of system. And so he says to Ahab, it's time for me to face off with the prophets of Baal. And you can bring all 450 of them, and it's just going to be me. But why don't we just decide once and for all, instead of you and I having this debate, I'm always calling you out, why don't we just see whose God is the real God? Let's meet at the mountain, and let's set up two altars. And so they do that. And so he gives the 450 prophets of Baal, he gives them a head start, he, he tells them to start calling out to their God, and so they begin by praying. They're praying and praying and praying, and nothing happens, there's no answer. So they started shouting their prayers, begging their God, begging their God to come and to answer them. From morning till noon, they're doing this. They've just wasted half the day shouting their prayers, but there's no answer. So they started dancing around the altar. Uh, maybe one prophet's doing the moon dance, another one's doing Madonna's Vogue. I'm sure there was a dude doing the chicken dance. That's about the only dance that I know. But they're doing all this dancing, trying to get the attention of their gods. Three of them are probably doing Gangnam style. But in the end, there's no answer, no response. And see, cultures have been praying and shouting and dancing around fires. They've been doing this for centuries. And Elijah's notion of what God is really like and what God really wants, it's so different. It's so different. In a way, He's putting on this display because he's, he's kind of asking the people, God's people who have turned from God, he's saying to them, is this how prayer works? Really? Is, is, is this what God wants? Can, can you do something in such a way that it just gets God's attention all the more? Is God like a cosmic vending machine? That if you just say things in a certain way or if you just, you just get the, 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 the magic the magic spell right that somehow God's going to give you what you want? Is that God? And Elijah knows this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. And so then he taunts them, and this is verse 27. It's my favorite verse, but it's pretty much in all English translations. It's neutered just a little bit. It says, at noon, Elijah mocked them, cry louder. If Baal is a god, maybe he's busy or he's having explosive poo emoji. Or he's traveling or perhaps you need to wake him up. Now that's the Pastor Jim translation. You're not going to find that in your Bible. But he's making a potty joke. And I'm not making this up. I put the poo emoji so I didn't have to say the word. But the Hebrew word is basically explosive diarrhea. That's what it is. He's mocking them. He's making fun of their God. And he does this not just out of disrespect. He does this because it's all a sham. It's not real. It's ridiculous. What Elijah knows is all religion is not basically the same. Some of it's spiritually dark. And it leads you astray. And it manipulates everything that we really know about God. And these 450 prophets, they're humiliated. And so if their prayers won't work, and if the shouting won't work, and if the, the fancy dancing won't work, they, they, finally, they finally start cutting themselves, literally dripping blood on the soil trying to get Baal's attention. 
This is their concept of religion. This is their concept of faith, of God. And I think if Elijah had given them another day, I think they would have taken that last step and they would have started child sacrifices right there in front of God's people, burning children as sacrifices. I have special concerns. My heart goes out to people who are suffering, and especially teens, especially teens that self-harm, cut themselves. I know you've all heard about it, but I think sometimes we don't hear about it enough. And, and it could be all kinds of self-worth issues. When I was in youth ministry, I saw it a lot. And it's a huge concern of mine. Because you have these problems, th- these emotions, this heartache that's going on in the inside, and this pain, it can seem easier to just feel it on the outside because you don't know how to express it on the inside. And so people will self-harm or... And it leads to other, other feelings of guilt or shame. And with the Baal worshipers in particular, this was a dark spiritual ritual that they were undergoing. And, and we want you to know, God does not want that for you. God doesn't want that for you. You are precious. You don't deserve that pain. You don't deserve to have those emotions bottled up. You don't deserve to be ridiculed, and your emotions are real, but you never, ever have to resort to self-harm. You're too important to God. You are too important to us. That's how precious you are. And one of the real tasks, I think, that we have as a church is to let people know how valuable they are. And I know that's what's happening out there in our culture right now. In the midst of coronavirus and all the stress that went with this, we're now going through racial tension because we have not valued people, people that God dearly loves. And I just think we as a people, we as a church, need to say that no one should be defined by those that strip us of our value. Because the value only comes from God. And Elijah, he sees what's happening to God's people in this context. He sees what's happening to God's people. And that's why he's bold in in standing up to the sadistic ritual. The sadistic ritual. And so let us cling to the God that wants to heal what God's people are going through there, but also wants to heal what's going on inside our culture right now. And it begins with understanding the value that we all have. And so Elijah, he starts to rebuild his altar. He rebuilds his altar with 12 stones representing each of their family groups, each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Everybody would see their family group stone placed and realize that Elijah was building his altar on top of them. He's reminding God's people who they are and who their God is. Then he had the people dump water all over his wood three times, so much so that it filled trenches around it. It's as if he's saying, I don't want anybody to think that I'm doing something. I don't want you to think the power comes from me. I don't want you to think that I'm rigging this altar. I want you to believe that God answers us. And so they soaked the wood that there was no way it would ever light up again, and then he prayed. And this is what he prayed in verse 37. He prayed, Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Elijah has had a tough journey, a tough journey. It hasn't been easy, but that is a godly prayer. It's a godly prayer, that they may know you, and that they may know that you are have turned their hearts back. It's you, God, doing this. This is a prayer of conversion. This is a prayer to come to faith. He's not just trying to win an argument here. He has no no interest in winning the argument. He wants to turn their hearts. And he's not trying to win anything for himself. He's not gonna make himself popular through this. But he wants God's people back to God. He wants his people to know God and for God to be the one to win them back. 
And here comes one of the coolest verses ever. Coolest verses in the Bible. Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and it consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Not just fire from heaven. Fire from heaven, super, super cool. But so hot that it burnt up the offering and the stones and the wood. It burned up the dust and it even licked up the water in the trench. Liquid stone, liquid hot magma. See, God's not going to just answer in a way that, that, that Elijah isn't going to see it or, or, or maybe it would go unnoticed. God answers in a big way to that kind of prayer. And that's why the people fell down and started to worship. Because God showed up in a big way. Now the the story ends, we didn't read this, but the story ends with the prophets of Baal being killed and then the miraculous rain comes and it finally ends the drought. Um, But that doesn't mean that anybody's gonna listen to Elijah now. Doesn't mean that Ahab suddenly is just gonna turn his heart. In fact, Jezebel tells Ahab that it's time to kill the prophet now. Now we really need to kill him which is another lesson in life. You can do all the right things. And and you can go to all the places that God wants you to go. And sometimes bad people are gonna dislike you even more because you did it. Give up a party lifestyle and become a morally upstanding person. Sometimes even your friends can turn against you when you do that kind of thing. It's like you're making a judgment on their life because you're improving your life. Of course you're not, but sometimes that's how they see it. And then later in life, you get to be my age, you realize maybe they weren't really my friends to begin with or not the kind of friends I needed. Jesus never promised that following God is easy. In fact, he said quite the opposite. He says it's like carrying your own cross. It's like carrying your own cross. He says, broad is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. It's a narrow way. It's a hard way, but it's a good way. In fact, Jesus, he lived a perfect life, and they killed him for it. And we call that day Good Friday. We don't call it Black Friday. We could call it Black Friday, but no, it's, it's not a dark day. It, it, it's not just a day that we remember the eclipse that was over the earth. No, it's a good Friday because what they saw as death, Jesus was actually defeating death. And it's good Friday because Jesus has now forgiven sinners. He's fought back the forces of evil and he's won us eternal life. We will know that God has done it just like with Elijah. Good Friday is good because it makes the gospel of Jesus Christ a free gift to all people. Jesus knows the narrow way is the better way. And Elijah knows the same thing. No matter where life takes you, God's way is always the right way. It's the way of love. It's the way of freedom. It's the way of forgiveness. And you can always have God with you. No matter the places you go. Our graduates, I wish you could have had the graduation that you were dreaming of. I know schools are trying to do it the best that they can. And we as a church really wanted to celebrate you with, with you as well. But you were seniors, and now you have graduated, and congratulations, we are so proud of you. So we're sending you a copy of this book. We're sending you a copy of the book, Oh, the Places You Will Go, because we want you to know that your church dreams alongside of you. We are dreaming about the future that God has for you. Just remember, Elijah was faithful. And for that, Eli- uh, Jezebel wanted to silence him. He ended up having to go into hiding in a cave. But yet he found that God was still faithful the whole time. His place changed, where he was going changed. But his mission stayed the same. And the same is going to happen to you along life's journey. You're going to go to different places. But your mission, the the purpose God has put into your life will always remain the same. But for more on that in the cave, tune in next week. Pastor Chuck is going to get into the rest of the story. He's going to complete the story of Elijah as he goes into a cave. So tune in 